So let me introduce our first speaker. Um, I'll preface it by saying that part of Renovasha's goal is to identify scholars who may not be very, very well known, but who are doing very valuable, amazing work, and, uh, and to bring their work to the attention of a broader audience than people just in their disciplines or in their um, uh, study areas. So that is fundamentally the goal of Renovasha. So that, and uh, Olodamini Ogunaiki is one of those young, brilliant scholars uh, we happen to discover and find, and I'm sure other people have known about him before, but a little about his background. Um, Olodamini is an assistant professor of, of religious studies at the College of William and Mary in Virginia. His research interests include the philosophical dimensions of post-colonial, colon colonial, and pre-colonial Islamic and indigenous religious traditions of West and North Africa. He has taught courses on Islam, Islamic philosophy, spirituality, art, and African and African diasporic religions. He also has a book in the works, um, so we look forward to seeing that when it's published. But before I ask him to join us up here, I want to read a short paragraph from the article that I think um, will help you kind of get in the sense of, of, of what he wrote and what he, um, what he might talk about today. So I'm going to read him. This is his words. These are his words from the article. The masterpieces of Islamic civilization communicate the beauty and truth of its revelation with a profound directness simply unmatched by articles or books about Islam. One of the many curious aspects of contemporary times provides proof. Despite the dissemination of virulent propaganda against Islam in the West, Many people from Western societies queue up for hours to admire the architecture of the Alhambra in Spain and the Taj Mahal in India, as well as exhibitions of Islamic calligraphy and miniature paintings, and to attend sold-out concerts of traditional Islamic music. This is due to another paradox. These most tangible and outward manifestations of the Islamic tradition represent its most subtle, inward, and essential realities. Hence, it seems, it is better to show than to tell. Please welcome to the stage Olodamani Ogunaiki. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming out here on a Sunday afternoon. I'd like to uh, start by acknowledging that um, the, uh, that we're on the land of the Ohlone people, the native people of this area. And I'd then like to thank uh, the organizers of this uh, wonderful event uh, and all the hard work that they put into doing this, which was substantial. So Safra and Najib, the people at Renovatio, um, and also the good people of Zaytuna College for hosting this. And I'd like to thank uh, Hamza Yusuf and Imam Zaid Shakir for the wonderful work they've been doing in this area and that they continue to do. So thank you for having me here and for putting on such, such a great event. Uh, so I'm kind of uh, at a loss for words a bit because uh, you actually took my opening. That was actually how I was going to open, that's how I opened my article and how I was going to open my speech, so you've already heard that. But basically, if, if and as I often am, as, as someone who teaches Islamic studies, asked to introduce Islam to someone who doesn't know anything about the religion, the civilization, anything, people ask me, well, what book can I read? What article can you recommend? I wouldn't, I say, no, I don't recommend an article. I say, listen to a recitation of the Quran, like the amazing one we just heard uh, here. Or uh, go read, this is Rumi's Mathnawi. Go, go read a couple verses of this. Or look at a beautiful uh, page of an illumined Quran, Quranic manuscript. Or a ghost, if I could, if I can take you to a, a beautiful mosque, and we just stand there in silence. To me, that is a better introduction to the Islamic worldview, Islam as a religion, Islam as a civilization, than any book or article, uh, for the reasons uh, that, that, that I, I, I mentioned. Um, and this is, uh, I think, best encapsulated in the words of the uh, famous scholar of, of art, and especially Islamic art, uh, Titus Burkhart. He said, just as a mental form, such as a dogma or a doctrine, can be an adequate, albeit limited, reflection of a divine truth, so a sensible, sensible form, like art, can retrace a truth or reality which transcends both the sensible, plane of sensible forms and the plane of thought. So if you sit there and without even knowing how to read Arabic, contemplate a page of beautiful illumined calligraphy or listen to the Quran, something happens. That, that art form is able to communicate that truth or that reality 
in a way that kind of cuts through uh, ideas, uh, uh, prejudices, suppositions, and through the direct experience of beauty, cut through all of that and speak directly to the soul, which is why I, I'm not the first person to do this, but people have called Islamic art a kind of silent theology that can speak more eloquently than any polemical uh, or discursive work. And there's a beautiful verse by the Sufi, Egyptian Sufi poet Ibn Farid that uh, I think encapsulates this nicely. He says, وَكَامْ بَيْنَ حِدَاكُ الْجِدَالِ تَنَزَّعُ وَمَا بَيْنَ عُرْشَاكُ الْجَمَالِ تُنَزِّعُ which is impossible to translate into English, but I translate it kind of, how often the clever debaters lock horns with one another, and how often the lovers of beauty are longing for each other. There's something about beauty that draws us together uh, and that does things that ordinary argument and speech simply can't do. So the language of beauty is a kind of universal language. Um, so how, how does Islamic art do this? Uh, and what is Islamic art? We've been talking Islamic art, this, Islamic art, that. What exactly are we talking about? So in the words of the eminent, probably the foremost living scholar of Islamic art today, Sayyid Hossein Nasser, he des defines Islamic art as the manifestation in the world of forms of the spiritual realities of the Islamic revelation itself. Now this is different from art made by Muslims. So someone like Zayn Malik, the singer who was in One Direction, he produces art, he's a Muslim, that's not Islamic art. Conversely, non-Muslims can make Islamic art. Prince Charles of England has a school of traditional art and architecture in, in London, and anyone there can learn how to do traditional Islamic calligraphy, uh, geometric design, uh, etc. So Islamic art uh, as something that brings the spiritual realities of the revelation into the world of forms serves as a kind of mirror of the unseen. It's like, I don't know if you've ever seen these false color images of nebulae or infrared cameras or UV uh, vision things. Those are things we ordinarily can't see. And yet through some encoding, they make these intangible realities tangible, sensible to us. This is exactly what Islamic art does. It takes the metaphysical realities of the alam al-ghayb the unseen world, and brings them into alam al-shahada, the visible, sensible, tangible world, so we can actually feel them, touch them, smell them, hear them. It, it brings the, the direct presence of the sacred to our senses. And this is why people who don't even understand Arabic at all will cry when they hear a beautiful recitation of the Quran, or when they walk into a beautiful mosque, Qutubiyya in Marrakesh, or the Blue Mosque in Istanbul is mentioned. It's a kind of stunned silence that comes over, regardless of their background or religious affiliation or anything. It's because they're coming face to face with the suprasensible face or reality, uh, with the sensible reality of a suprasensible form, an archetype. And uh, you get a direct lived experience of the sacred. And this is why the contemporary kind of neglect or pushing to the side of Islamic art is such a cause for concern. Um, because neglecting Islamic art and neglecting beauty is, is as bad as not saying your prayers. Because it gradually makes God unreal. Uh, the presence of the sacred becomes distant and is no longer felt. As a famous hadith, I'm sure all of you know it, in Allah Jamil wa yuhibbul jamal. God is beautiful and he loves beauty. So indifference to beauty is actually indifference to the divine. It's, it's a very serious matter. And beauty is therefore thus, contra the contrapositive of that is that beauty is a criterion of Islamic authenticity. Anything authentically Islamic must be beautiful. If you look at this in the Islamic world, any expression of the truth, the Quran being the highest, the expression of the truth for excellence is always accompanied by beauty. Very rarely do you hear an ugly recitation of the Quran. Very rarely do you go into a mosque that's ugly. It's always beautiful. Manuscripts, always beautiful. And Muslims put a lot of time and care over centuries into making expressions of the truth beautiful because as Plato said, beauty is the splendor of the true. Beauty and truth are not separable. So to understand even just concretely the role that beauty plays in Islamic lives, you only need to consider the central concept of ihsan, translated as perfection or excellence um, in the famous hadith of Jibril, hadith of Gabriel, which defines Islam as the five pillars, Iman as articles of belief, and Ihsan as the kind of third dimension, the depth, the profundity of these two. And this hadith describes Ihsan as worshiping God as if you see him, for if you don't see him, then he sees you. This worshiping God as if you see him, that is achieved through the Islamic arts. When you're in a mosque, and you see the beautiful calligraphy on the wall, the beautiful geometric designs on the walls, on the carpets, even the, the form of the architecture itself 
allows you to worship God as if you're seeing him because you're seeing his beauty reflected in the beauty of the art forms there. And so uh, it's like interesting in Arabic, husn, the root of ihsan means at once beauty and goodness. So in Islamic thought, beauty, goodness, and truth are never separable. Now beauty always provokes love. Love always attaches itself to some kind of beauty. So with the Islamic arts, they inspire love for God. And love is the only, uh, is, is really the criterion of sincerity. The only true sincere motivation to do anything is, is out of love. Any other motivation that you have is some kind of selfish, uh, self-interest compromising it. So when we compromise beauty or are indifferent to beauty, we compromise or undermine love. And there are several hadith that say, none of you believes until you love God and his prophet more than your wealth, your children, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And when we compromise love or undermine love, we undermine sincerity, sincerity of worship. And without sincerity, all we have is the husk of hypocrisy. There's nothing there. And this is part of why the Islamic arts are so important. You can't have ihsan without ihsan, without husn, without the beauty of, of the Islamic arts. Um, so the Islamic arts help us perceive the beauty of God, and which in turn inspires in us love for God, which is the proper intention of worship, which then leads us to experience the love of God. So as the Prophet was commanded to say in the Quran, say, if you love God, follow me. You follow the Prophet, why? Because you love God, out of love, and God will love you. So the beginning and end is, is love. But returning to the question of how exactly Islamic art accomplishes all of this, there's a great uh, poem, a uh, little verse by Rumi from his Mathnawi, um, in which she says, Mutreb uh, Agazid, Pisha Turke Mast, Dar Hijabi Nagme, Asrare Alast. So before the drunken Turk, the musician began to play, behind the veil of melody, the secrets of Alast, Alast, the eternal covenant. Um, before uh, we were brought into this world, the Quran says that God said, Allah tu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? And everyone replied, bala shahidna, it's the original call and response. And so that, that moment outside of time, before, uh, before time, before creation, is called the day of alast. And so this musician, what Rumi is talking about in, the, in this verse, the, the drunken Turk is a person steeped in forgetfulness, is the person drowned in this world of multiplicity. And he's brought, he's woken up, he's brought out of his drunken stupor, by the musician's melodies, which are recalling the secrets of his true or her true origin, of her true self, through the veil of melody. So it's like if, if there's something invisible, how do you see it? You throw a blanket on it, you put a veil on it, and then you start to see its outdoor contours and, and, and outlines. And that's exactly what the Islamic arts do. They throw the veil of certain beautiful forms over these metaphysical realities, uh, in order to, as Rumi says in this poem, remind us of our true selves, of our eternal origin, of our source, of our home. Now, in general, uh, modern non-sacred arts do something different. In general, they tend to make things not more transparent, as Islamic arts try to do, but more opaque. They usually reflect um, not our eternal home or source, but power dynamics, efficiency, profit, and they often lead to forgetfulness of these eternal principles, not rem remembering not reminding ourselves of them. Um, and this is because all art has a philosophy behind it, all art. All art assumes a cosmology, meaning a philosophy of time and space, what they are, our place therein, metaphysics of what's real and what's not, ethics and aesthetics of what's good and what's not and why. And so every choice that an artist makes, whether or not he or she is aware of it, is guided by these ideas, ideas and ideals. And so, and also the way an audience receives an art. So the specific nature of Islamic physics, metaphysics, and cosmology means that, which is drawn from the Quran and the Sunnah, uh, and the vision of reality that results from living them, uh, means that the Islamic art takes specific forms uh, based on these specific uh, metaphysics, the specific philosophy or, or worldview. And it's too, it's describing Islamic cosmology in an hour lecture would be absurd, so I'm not even going to try to do it here, but let's just give you a little taste. So, in general, Islamic cosmological metaphysical tradition describes God, the one, as creating through or manifesting himself through a variety of metaphors, one of the most prevalent of which is through language. God creates by the pen, he speaks the word kun, and brings everything into being, and also through number. The Quran says God creates everything according to proportion um, and number. And so this explains to a certain degree the incredible attention that the Islamic civilization put on understanding language and mathematics. 
every, more than uh, anything else, Muslim scholars wrote about language, the sciences of language, and uh, mathematics, which ultimately are the same. Arabic, like a number of ancient languages, letters are equivalent to numbers, and so there's this kind of the same thing. And so the Islamic arts emphasize in everything that they do these archetypal realities of letter and number. So if you look at these beautiful carpets we have here, you have all kinds of floral forms and even animal forms, but they're abstracted to their kind of metaphysical archetypes, their numeric, geometric uh, archetypes. And this is what Islamic art does. Um, and so as the example of truth and kind of the structure par excellence, the Quran in both its content and its structures deeply shapes the Islamic arts. So uh, to give a concrete example, the highest art in, uh, in Islam is the recitation of the Quran. It's the way the Quran was, well, was revealed first as a recitation. It's the word made book. In Christianity and Western civilization in general, the highest art is a painting, painting of the icon, because Christianity represents the word made flesh. And so the highest art is the representation of that. So painting is usually the most, if you go into a Western museum anywhere, most of what they have there is paintings. They don't have calligraphy. But uh, in Islamic art, you'll find calligraphy and chronic recitation occupying the highest place. So recit chronic recitation is language in time. It's this archetypal reality of language in time coupled with music, coupled with number in time. Music is really the experience of number of proportion in time, in beautiful forms. And a beautiful recitation of the Quran brings the reality and the truths of the Quran closer to us and us closer to the Quran. And even the structure of uh, certain musical structures, maqams, um, nubas in Andalusia, daska in Persian music, rags in uh, Hindustani music, actually the very structures of the music mirror certain structures you find in the Quran. They begin and end on the same notes in the same way they have certain ring structures, motifs repeated again and again, and it's all about different proportions. Um, and also then poetry is kind of an echo of a major art form in the Islamic world. You can pick up a book on mathematics or geometry and they'll, be po they'll quote poems in it, or the whole work will be a poem. There are poems that you learn geometry from in the Islamic tradition. And poetry is based on meter and rhyme. Uh, it's kind of an echo of the Quran and its function is to make the ayat, the signs of the world, clear to us, to make connections between them and teach us how to read the signs in the world, the signs in ourself, and the signs in scripture. So I, I think I've become a much better reader of the Quran because I've read Hafez and Rumi's Masnavi and Ibn al-Farid. It's kind of taught me how to read uh, the Quran, to read things with multiple levels of meaning. Uh, moving now to language and space, calligraphy. Calligraphy takes the revelation and puts it into space and puts it into a space governed by geometry, which is number and space. And calligraphy is an incredible art form. I'll leave it to the calligraphers to tell us a bit more about it. Um, but calligraphy uh, is used even in spiritual practices of visualization. It itself is a kind of spiritual practice. It cultivates concentration, connects the hand and the heart. Um, and it's deeply connected with architecture. Architecture um, is, again, number in space, proportion in space. And architecture serves, Islamic architecture serves as the space in which the revelation reverberates and it's deeply connected to Islamic cosmology. To give you a quick example, you'll often find in Islamic world domes, and domes represent heaven, celestial sphere, and then beneath the dome, you'll find an octagonal structure, an eight-pointed star. And the star represents the divine throne, so kind of boundary between the celestial world and the, 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 the earthly world. And in the Quran, the throne is described as being carried by eight angels. So you have this octagonal structure, and then you'll have a base of usually four sides, a square base representing the four elements, the four, uh, four cardinal directions, etc. And you'll find this everywhere throughout the Islamic world, from uh, all, all over the place, on saints' tombs, on mosques, on madrasas, um, and several other ways. There are many deep connections between Islamic architecture. Uh, but one of the most important features of Islamic architecture is the void. You go into a mosque, especially for someone, if you've been used to seeing cathedrals, you spend a day, let's say, in Spain visiting cathedrals, and then you go into uh, the La Mesquita in Cordoba, you'll be struck by its emptiness, uh, this, this kind of void, um, which is the uh, kind of architectural exper uh, experience of the first shahada, la ilaha illallah, there's no God but God, of the irreality of everything in the world in, comp in the face of, of the absolute. Um, uh, Churchill once said, uh, we shape our buildings and then they shape us. And Islamic architecture has been shaping Muslims in very conscious and profound ways uh, for centuries uh, that we can't afford to ignore. It's a very important art. And finally, I'll turn briefly to geometric design, 
which geometric, the incredible tessellations and geometric designs that you often see on walls, on books, on carpets. And this really is, if you could take the sound of the Quran and put it in visual form, that's what these geometric designs are. The Quran has, was full of repeating motifs, and the Quran is, has this mysterious quality where it kind of has its center anywhere. In Muslims' daily prayers, when they recite the Quran, when we recite the Quran, you can start anywhere. You can start anywhere. And so there's, just like these geometric designs, the center is everywhere. And it kind of continues on in any direction uh, endlessly with repeated motifs and rhythms and patterns. If any of you are familiar with Surah Rahman, if you hear that, it's exactly like a tessellated work of, of, of geometry. Not to mention certain things like the ring structures that are in the Quran that you also see uh, manifested in these geometric uh, designs. Several other Islamic arts, arts of clothing, which are very important, perfume, food, um, and that, but they all served as a function to support the highest art, which is the remembrance of God. Um, and in traditional Islamic civilization, the Islamic arts and the divine art of nature, which was the first mosque, uh, were for everyone, rich and poor alike. Uh, beauty was not and should not be a luxury. The soul needs beauty like the body needs air, water, and food. And so just as our bodies, in a sense, become what we eat, our souls become what we look at, what we listen to, what we think about, what we contemplate. And so when the Islamic arts are lost or forgotten or neglected, what, what happens to the souls of Muslims? The Islamic arts are windows or doors through which we can access the deepest truths of the cosmos, of the revelation, and ourselves. And so the loss of the Islamic arts is, I think, deeply connected to the rise of this extreme sectarianism and the overall difficulty of perceiving unity in diversity. Because in traditional Islamic uh, cosmology and metaphysics, the higher one goes up the levels of reality, the closer one gets to the divine presence. Because God is one, things become more unified. And so those without access to those higher levels of reality, of unity, have a diff more difficult time perceiving and participating in harmony which is the presence of unity in multiplicity. And so as a consequence, there's more disharmony uh, on the level of, of forms. The Islamic arts serve as a bridge between these two worlds, worlds of unity and the world of multiplicity, the worlds of meaning and the worlds of form. And so those with a deep appreciation of the Islamic arts can appreciate the barakah and the spiritual realities represented in the art of different civilizations, Timurid, Central Asia, Safavid, Iran, uh, Almohad, Morocco, uh, Mamluk, Egypt, regardless of the official legal school or theology of those dynasties. And moreover, anyone familiar with the deep principles of the Islamic arts can recognize the same principles at work, albeit in a different mode, in the great sacred arts of other religious traditions, Buddhist iconography, Hindu temples, uh, the music of Bach, uh, for example. And so uh, as Muslims, if we lose touch with the knowledge of the arts, we lose touch with knowledge of ourselves, of our tradition, ultimately of God. We lose touch with reality and the ability to recognize the truth and humanity of those who differ from us. And as I said before, indifference to beauty is as bad and is connected to indifference to the truth and goodness. And this kind of callous indifference to beauty in general and the Islamic arts in particular leads to a kind of unrefined coarseness of character. It's not an accident that the Islamic literary arts were called adab. Uh, they are how generations of Muslims learned adab, which means courtesy and refinement. It's a word that at the same time means kind of literature and also courtesy and refinement, good manners. So as Sayyid Hossein Nasser wrote, to destroy this art, Islamic art, is to empty the soul and mind of the Muslim to a large extent of its Islamic content, leaving a vacuum which is then rapidly filled by the worst clutter, noise, and banality of the modern world, as is the case of many a person today. So if we, and finally, I want to conclude with uh, another note, which is if we view being Muslim as an art, as a craft, as opposed to an identity, if we view being a Muslim as a craft of purifying our hearts, trying to follow in the Prophet's example, trying to know God, conform to the example of the Prophet, um, we can understand how different approaches can lead to the same or similar goal. So I think th this recent epidemic of takfir, of Muslims calling each other's unbelievers, can be ameliorated by understanding the practice of Islam as an art form, as a craft of cultivation of love of and conformity to divine beauty, rather than as an either or identity. And this seems to be the way generations of Muslims have understood uh, the practice of Islam before us. 
So while many have attempted to reduce the Islamic tradition to a list of do's and don'ts in the area of belief and practice, uh, the Islamic arts serve as a powerful reminder of the more profound realities of the tradition and the whole purpose of the Islamic tradition itself, which is to return the human being to the fitra, to the highest art of bringing the human soul back to that reality, its original nature, which perfectly reflects all of the divine names and attributes, both the Jalal, the, the majestic, and the Jamal, the beautiful. Thank you very much. <laughs>